before I get started, how many of you know who Margaret Sanger is? No, no know who Margaret Sanger is? And you know something about her, her history? Um, I'm, just in case, I'm going to go over just a few uh, of the facts of her life. She uh, was born in 1879. She was the seventh of 11 children. Uh, she was raised by a free-thinking father and a Roman Catholic mother. Uh, she left the church rather early on. Um, she married uh, an architect, William Sanger, and had three children. And she trained as a nurse. Uh, she and her husband also became involved in socialist radical causes, and she became an organizer for the, oh, here it is, uh, for the New York Women's Socialist Party, among other things. She also was active in the um, uh, industrial workers of the world. Uh, these are her children, uh, by the way. Um, as a nurse on the Lower East Side, she was treating a lot of women who were dying uh, from backstreet abortions, mostly because they couldn't get access to whatever birth control was available. She also found that many women had almost no knowledge of uh, their own reproductive system, let alone about any of the most effective methods. Uh, as a radical socialist, she was convinced that the only way to achieve economic equality was to give women sexual equality, to free them from the burden of unwanted pregnancy. Uh, this would also make them sexually equal uh, to men in other ways. Uh, and she had gone to Paris and found out about the latest methods there, which Paris seemed to be the the city in which to find this out. Um, and in 1914, she decided to publish a journal called The Woman Rebel. The journal was aimed at working women, uh, and she asserted the right of women uh, to control their own bodies and advocated uh, the use of birth control. She knowingly uh, uh, did this, uh, aware that she was violating federal obscenity laws. Um, the Comstock laws, as they were known. And as soon as she published the first issue, postal authorities came down on her and tried to suppress subsequent issues. She kept publishing them. She published seven issues until uh, she was arrested and indicted. Uh, she was facing 20 years uh, imprisonment um, if she was convicted uh, on federal charges. Unwilling to do this, she took a train uh, to Montreal in November 1914 got a passport under an alias. Uh, Bertha Watson was the alias. Um, here we go. And she sailed to England. Um, but before leaving New York, she had prepared a pamphlet called Family Limitation. Uh, and in this pamphlet, uh, she had um, offered the most detailed, frank information about available forms of birth control and instructions on how to use them. Uh, and upon sailing to England, she had these pamphlets released. If she were going to violate Comstock laws, this pamphlet was the way to really do it. However, unfortunately for Anthony Comstock, she was out of reach in England. Um, <coughs> exiled in England, Margaret Sanger, already separated from her first husband, William Sanger, was not happy to learn that he had been arrested for selling an undercover agent a copy of Family Limitation. William Sanger was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 30 days in the tombs. Uh, she was even less happy when she found out how much publicity he was getting for a cause that she had launched. Uh, and so she hightailed it back to New York. Uh, and in the fall of 1915, she was ready to stand trial. But then suddenly, her five-year-old daughter Peggy died of pneumonia. Sanger's loss brought her waves of sympathetic publicity, and the government didn't want to make a martyr out of a grieving mother. Uh, and so they dropped the charges against her. But Margaret Sanger was not done baiting the government. In 1916, she opened the nation's first birth control clinic in Brownsville, Brooklyn. She adv advertised it in flyers written in English, Italian, and Yiddish. And she and her sister Ethel Byrne, who was also a trained nurse, and a friend, Fanya Mendel, who was fluent in Yiddish, sat ready and hoped the women would come. And come they did. Some 400 lined up within a few days uh, to use the clinic services. Once again, uh, government authorities came down on her. Uh, 
The clinic was shut after, again, an undercover female agent came in asking for birth control information. Uh, Sanger, her sister, and Mendel were arrested for violating this time New York State's obscenity laws. Stanger this time, Sanger this time stood trial and was convicted and spent 30 days in the Queens County Penitentiary where she offered other prisoners birth control information. She also appealed the conviction and in the 1919 appeal decision she got a legal loophole. The judge said birth control could only be dispensed by doctors when medically indicated. So Sanger opened a legal clinic run by a female physician who could now legally dispense birth control in New York. It was the nation's first legal birth control clinic and the model for a network of clinics around the country. Sanger also pushed, pushed for more education and better organization through the American Birth Control League, which she organized in 1921. During the 20s and 30s, Sanger decided to try to mainstream the movement, get the support of medical and scientific professionals, and financial support from the wealthier women who were interested in the cause. But she soon found she was being pushed aside by the very forces she fought to bring into the movement. Physicians and other professionals didn't want a laywoman involved in their movement, and the wealthier conservative women she had brought in were nervous about her radical roots. By 1939, when the clinic she had opened and the American Birth Control League merged into the Birth Control Federation of America, Sanger was feeling out of step with the movement's goals and strategies. And in 1942, when that federation changed its name to the Planned Parenthood Federation of America, a name Sanger hated, uh, she knew she had lost control. But Sanger was not without power or direction in these years, though she unsuccessfully fought to get federal legislation legalizing birth control passed in Congress. By the way, that legislation was not, not birth control, I should say, was not made legal. Uh, until 1965, a year before Sanger died. She did manage to get a test case launched, uh, U.S. versus one package in 1936. She had a package of contraceptives imported from Japan when they were held up at customs. Uh, she had the case she wanted. The trial ended with a judicial ruling that allowed doctors, again, to import and dispense birth control. Uh, in effect, uh, she had defied the anti-birth control laws with this judicial ruling. Sanger was also spending more and more time um, trying to globalize the birth control movement. I just wanted to give you the picture of Sanger at a meeting with Gandhi, uh, where she tried to convince Gandhi that abstinence was not the best way uh, <laughs> to control families. Gandhi was not convinced. Uh, nevertheless, uh, Sanger continued and was successful in uh, bringing birth control and talking about it in places like Japan and India in the 1920s and 30s. And after World War II, uh, she helped launch the International Planned Parenthood Federation uh, in Bombay and served as its first president until 1959. But this was still not enough. What Sanger wanted was for women to have access uh, not only to public health services, uh, for the government to pay for birth control, because birth control was, she thought, a legitimate health measure. But she wanted women to have access to cheaper, easier to use, more reliable birth control. And what Sanger was interested in was having women control this. Uh, women could control their own bodies, and they should make the decisions on when and whether to have children. Um, she wanted and she invested in efforts to do research to get all kinds of spermicides and foam powders and uh, all kinds of things. In 1950, she introduced philanthropist Catherine McCormick of the McCormick Harvester uh, family to a scientist by the name of Gregory Pincus. And with McCormick's, McCormick's money and Pincus and his colleagues' efforts, they developed the first birth control pill, uh, which was put on the market just a few years before Sanger died. There's a lot more to Sanger, obviously. You'll have to read the book if you want more details. Um, but as the editor of the Margaret Sanger papers, one of the questions I am most often asked is why I am not writing a biography um, instead of editing and publishing her papers. One of the most persuasive answers uh, to this question was unwittingly provided by Sanger herself. 
Uh, sometime in 1953, Sanger received a letter from Vincent Brougham, who was writing a biography of her mentor, her friend, and her lover, Havelock Ellis. Brougham asked Sanger to answer six very personal questions. Among them, was Ellis impotent? And what was the nature of Ellis's relationship with his wife, Edith? who, though a lesbian, was very jealous of Sanger and who committed suicide in 1916, and a variety of other very personal questions. Sanger responded to Brougham in January of 1954 with a six-page single-spaced letter, which luckily uh, survived. Uh, but in it, she wrote, all of these details that I'm giving you are strictly confidential. It is for a biographer to know about the life of his subject more than can be published. It is the duty, it seems to me, historically and morally, for a biographer to sieve through the finest screen possible all the experiences and the knowledge obtained about his subject and to give posterity only the events and the ideas that add to the theme of the life of his subject. Uh, our knowledge of Sanger is similarly sieved through the lens of biographers. In biography, it runs through the bi in biographers, it runs through the authorial voice of the biographer. The dominant voice you hear is the biographer's voice. But in addition, we try to make the subject the dominant voice. Uh, it's Sanger's voice you should hear most clearly in reading books of her letters. That's not to say you won't hear my voice, the editor's voice. Editors make lots of decisions that affect the way in which we hear uh, a subject's voice. One of the first decisions uh, we make is the design and scope of an edition. At the Sanger Papers, as you learned, we've got over 130,000 documents to deal with. Uh, that's something like 230,000 pages, maybe more. And we still are finding some. These are letters and diaries and speeches and uh, interviews. Uh, since I started the project back in the Stone Age of 1987, when we were still publishing microfilm, uh, the first thing I did was publish a microfilm edition of everything I could find, 101 reels. And this was in addition to what the Library of Congress had already published, their microfilm of their collections. We're also publishing a digital edition of the speeches and writings of Sanger. Uh, here we're taking all of her uh, public statements, articles, uh, interviews, press releases, uh, pamphlets transcribing them and we're encoding them to make the notes to make the documents more than just keyword searchable in other words you you can get a list of all documents that discuss death from abortion even if she never uses the actual word abortion uh, which is often the case and finally we're publishing the selected papers of margaret sanger which is the four volume book edition these volumes offer a more focused look at sanger's life and work they will only include some 900 to 1,000 documents, with each document transcribed and contextualized in headnotes and endnotes and chapter openings. Our volumes of letters provide more focused information about Sanger's role in the birth control movement, more information about how such movements were started, how they developed, why they took the direction they did, sometimes how movements were lost. Uh, information about her friends and colleagues, her opponents, her enemies, her family, her lovers, um, and obviously more intense and detailed information, not only on what Sanger did and wrote, but what we can glean in terms of what she thought and believed, and how she presented herself privately as well as publicly. Here, for example, is Sanger giving advice to her friend Juliet Rubley on saving the marriage of another friend whose husband had cheated on her. Now, she wrote, to the crux of the situation, sex without love. To refuse him will, of course, separate them entirely. If she wants to win him back, there is only one way to do it, to make their sex relations so lovely and satisfying that he can't do without her. Certainly, she must sleep with him and not refuse him sex expression and not take it too seriously. I feel like Dorothy Dix in advice to the lovelorn. Now, Sanger would never have made such a st statement publicly. She was portraying herself as a wife and mother, promoting birth control only to ensure happier, healthier families. Uh, sex without marriage uh, was not something she would ever talk about, even though in practice this was a large part of what she believed. Uh, 
birth control would make women sexually equal to men, both inside and outside of marriage. Um, so it's an interesting letter, but what can we deduce from it? That she liked to give rather facile advice, yes. That she thought herself very practical and modern in 1954 at the age of 75, yes. That she viewed satisfying sexual relations as an equal partnership, yes. But a biographer using this to extrapolate more conclusions about Sanger's views of sex, of women, of herself, of birth control would have to be very careful to know how and where the letter fits into the larger corpus of material. Did she write a lot of letters like this? Did she give a lot of advice like this? Or was this letter unique? Uh, if it's unique, you have to interpret it somewhat differently. Um, how did it fit into her views and her actions on the significance of birth control? Maybe the question is, should it even be included? Uh, should it even be mentioned? Editors often have to make the same decisions about which documents to mention. Certainly they have to make decisions about which documents to include or exclude. Uh, biographers make similar decisions, but biographers don't have the luxury of studying all the documents in the same detail as the editors do. We take each and every one of the documents we find, we identify dates, authors, recipients, and Often, we identify every place, person, or event mentioned in the letter, and we deduce the meaning of the letter as we can see that. Biographers don't have the time to do that. They sift through a lot of documents, they take a lot of notes, they certainly know their subjects. Uh, and I'm not saying one is better than the other, it's just different. Uh, it offers a different kind of interpretation. Uh, and it offers the users uh, a more active role in interpretation. I see these additions as a kind of dialogue. The document talks to the editor. The document talks to the reader. The editor talks to the reader in the end notes and the footnotes. And the reader should come away uh, with their own conclusions about the, about the letter, about the subject, about the individual being discussed. Another example of uh, how selection and transcription uh, can affect a letter, it's a 1915 letter from Sanger to her husband, William. Uh, she expresses, expresses in this letter her anger at being treated by him as, in her words, a blank porter. I'm reading the word preceding porter as blank because it's crossed out in the original document. It's scratched out. Can't read it. However, by closely studying the original, we can make out that the word she struck out was nigger. We believe that the word was crossed out sometime after the letter was written, perhaps years after and only possibly by Sanger herself, more likely by one of her assistants or family members. So we can tell the readers what the word actually was. We can tell the readers the word was crossed out. We can show the readers what the, word, what the letter looked like. We can also tell the readers that is the only instance we could find in which she ever used that term or when she ever used a racial epithet. Uh, and we can perhaps uh, tell the readers uh, something more. We could say, well, this indicates that Sanger was a racist, or it indicates that she was typical of her time, or it indicates nothing more that she was angry at William Sanger and was using the vocabulary of her time. When we produce the actual letter in an edition, you will make your own, dis own conclusions about that. When you're reading a biography, for the most part, the biographer is making that conclusion for you. And you can agree with that conclusion or not. So again, it's a more direct conversation we're having. Margaret Sanger died in 1966 at the age of 87. She had been nominated for a Nobel Prize. She had been eulogized throughout the world. She had achieved fame and prominence. More significantly, she was the first to define and promote birth control as a fundamental right of women. Her efforts placed birth control squarely in the center of national and international debate, and she has been properly included among the 50 most significant people of the 20th century. But she also left a legacy that remains controversial today, as controversial as the ongoing debate over birth control. And we must deal with the realities of this controversy as we select letters for these editions. Selection is one of the most difficult and creative jobs of the editor. This is where any remaining pretense of objectivity disappears. 
I could, for example, omit any letter in which Sanger uses such a racial epithet or discusses race or eugenics or sterilization, which, by the way, she advocated for those people with hereditary physical or mental uh, diseases. Then I would have a nice heroic view of Sanger, uh, untouched or unmarred by any controversy. Or I could include every one of the documents in which she talks about this and maybe group them together to really uh, pound uh, on the uh, fact that she held some very controversial issues. Um, whatever I decide, cha decide changes or can change the interpretation you're going to get uh, of Sanger. So once you become selective, you can create an entity that's substantially different than the one you could, were doing if you were less selective or uh, a more comprehensive edition. Also, once you begin selecting letters for inclusion or omission, you have to explain. Uh, you have to explain all of this to the reader, uh, that these are samples, that these are typical, that these are atypical. Uh, you have to explain the gaps, what happened in between. Uh, one letter and another. Uh, all of these decisions, again, affect interpretation. Um, there was a very interesting article in the Sunday's New York Times. It was a review about uh, a book, a biography of Queen Victoria. And it was actually, a, a, the biography also included a study of the edited letters of Queen Victoria. And the, uh, the reviewer noted that Victoria was the domestic queen, the world's most powerful working woman who managed to reign over a, a, a quarter of the globe's inhabitants while insisting a woman's most important role was that of wife and mother. Uh, yet at the same time, in the 113 years since her death, the myth has taken root that Queen Victoria disliked her children. Some even say she disliked all children. Uh, and a string of quotes are often cited about poor Victoria. Uh, now, in this new book, um, we see documentation of how the restor historical record of Victoria was warped by the two men who edited her letters um, and defined her as a subordinate queen, uh, a mere accessory to men who surrounded her, uh, is what these editors say. One of them was Lytton Strachey, so, uh, and he's a biggie. Uh, both of the editors also crucially viewed Victoria as only ancillary to the men around her. Um, only 40% of the letters in the volumes of her letters are actually hers. Uh, most of the others were written to her by prominent men. And the correspondence with female relatives and friends is scant. Uh, this author says uh, the reason is that the editors were bored by correspondence um, between women. It was very tiresome, they said. Uh, and so you have a view of uh, Victoria sieved, if you will, uh, through the views uh, of the men editing her, uh, her letters. Uh, the view of editors who didn't like women much, weren't that interested in women's issues, and more, were more interested in the monarchy uh, than in the woman. Um, a different editor would have offered you a very different portrait uh, of Queen Victoria, uh, someone who was uh, clearly fond of her children, hard on her children, but certainly not uh, a terrible mother, as they would have you believe. Um, as many editors have encountered, among the biggest problems we encounter in selection is also that we become unreasonably attached to a document or maybe an issue that doesn't fit our selection criteria, uh, perhaps because I stumbled on a document uh, in a dank basement in Wales in my search for documents, and there it was, a New Sanger document, and I was very excited. I was so proud of my research skills that I wanted the document in the volume no matter how boring it was. Um, or there's something about the language or the tone of humor of a document that claims this. My associate editor um, insisted on including a Sanger article because he liked a line about the capitalist vomiting up workers from the factories so much. Um, in our second volume, I became unreasonably attached to a letter from Sanger to Havelock Ellis about a man who could only get sexually aroused if he pulled his partner's tooth. I found this so odd that I wanted to include it, even though it had nothing to do with the volume or the issue. The same goes for a 1935 letter from a potato farmer in Sagaponak, uh, in which he writes, 
uh, Mrs. Sanger, I have just listened to your radio talk on birth control. I abhor you. Your talk sounded very plausible to one that has had no experience, but th for those who have tried your devilish ideas, it is amusing. I am the father of six children, all well, born in the period of 10 years. My wife, unbeknown to me, took up birth control, and after these six, I have two more in the cemetery, and my wife's ovaries and womb is hanging in a bottle in the Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. My wife never had any trouble in any way with the first six children, and after the use of birth control, she had plenty and very near put herself in the cemetery. Account for that, he wrote. Um, it's a great letter. I'm not sure it belonged in the volume. Um, which brings me to another issue we had to deal with, what we call client letters. Hundreds of thousands of letters from ordinary women and some men asking Sanger for birth control information or advice or telling her what they were going through, sometimes indicating their displeasure uh, with her as well. Often they recounted really sad stories of multiple pregnancies and miscarriages and abortion and the hardships of poor families trying to feed and clothe too many children. And Sanger received these letters for over three decades. She received almost 72,000 in 1923 alone. Um, and although many of them were destroyed, several hundred uh, were preserved. Now we can only include 250 documents in a volume. Um, and that's even high. So how do we pick which client letters to include? Um, for example, a 1921 letter lives, we live 100 miles from the railroad, but my mother obtained family limitation and sent it to me. My husband is afraid, however, that I will use something that will injure me. But I tell him I'd rather be dead than have a wee one, no matter how I love them, every year. This last one, a seven-month baby, came when I was all alone with just my other babies. So when I think what I went through that terrible night, I feel that I can never have another. Um, another one read, Ma'am, I order one of your books, The Woman and the New Race, to find out how to keep from bringing those little ones into the, this awful world. I am a poor woman and have worked so hard all my life and I have been married four years, the 25 December, and I have already given birth to three children and all three of my children are boys and I am almost all broken down and I'm only 24 years old. Mrs. Sanger, I want you to write me in return mail what to do to keep from bringing these little ones to this awful world. One of my personal favorites from 1924 read, my dear Mrs. Sanger, to me intercourse is so very, very repulsive. Will you help me? I have been married three years and have two lovely children. I have never cared for intercourse as a normal woman should, although before my first baby came, I did enjoy it. Six months before the second baby was born, I began to grow nervous and irritable. I grew continually worse and became so dreadfully nervous when I even thought my husband wanted intercourse. We practiced total abstinence three months before the baby came, thinking that afterwards I would be better. But it is just as bad as ever. What do you make of it? I will be anxious for your answer. How could we select which ones to include? Uh, what we ended up doing was that each of uh, the three editors on the project uh, chose the ones they liked best for each decade. And then we sat around and we chose uh, from this smaller sample two and three documents uh, per decade uh, based on uh, class, race, ethnicity, and uh, the variety of problems that were uh, indicated. We also tended to include those that had Sanger's response because we thought that was an interesting uh, uh, kind of coupling. Um, if you're going to do a lot of selection also, you need to keep in mind what you're gonna, that you're going to have to explain what you left out. Um, for example, we included a 1914 handwritten letter from, this is the letter actually, Margaret Sanger's first husband, William Sanger, after she left him in Paris in 1913 and went home to New York City with their three children, decided that they should separate. Keep in mind, we have n almost no correspondence from Sanger to her husband in this period. And it's a critical period because not only did the couple separate, but Sanger was engaged in several affairs, which might account for the separation. And she was also preparing to start up her journal, uh, The Woman Rebel. In addition, William Sanger's decision to stay in Paris to paint might have angered Sanger, who was left with no income 
uh, if her husband was off doing that. Uh, so it would have been very nice to have her, her letters, but we don't. What we have are a lot of letters from him to her. We had to make a decision. We actually have 15 of them. Uh, include them all to get an overall picture. But again, we have a very small edition, and his letters often run four to five pages in length. Um, we could extract the good bits, but extracting pieces from a document requires a lot of explanation. You have to tell the reader what you left out, uh, why you left it out, where this bit fits in the larger letter. You can do it, but readers are going to have to trust that you have not omitted what they think is the important part of the letter. And William's letters are very hard to extract. Uh, because he doesn't clearly begin or end his sentences. There's almost no punctuation. And also, he includes both useful and not so useful information in the same sentence. So extracting this means that you're going to have a letter with mostly ellipses, which doesn't look nice. Uh, our choice was we selected one letter, the best of the group, the one with the most information of interest to us, and the least irrelevant information. And then we told readers in a head note that there are 14 other letters just like this one. He's lonely, he's angry, she betrayed him, he wants her back, he's painting. They mostly say the same thing. They're often written while he's drunk. Um, and we don't have to put the readers through the agony of having to uh, wade through all of this. Um, OK, once we've made all these decisions and we have our selection, we have to look at the volume and figure out what kind of volume did we have. As I read it through over and over, I became more conscious of the extent to which I was creating a volume to be read from beginning to end rather than consulted as a reference. I had, after all, a microfilm edition that you could use. But this volume had multiple narrative lines all woven together, a volume that could, I believe, function as an alternative to a traditional uh, biography. And if you do read the volume from beginning to end, what comes out is a great deal that would not, I think, be evident if we didn't do this kind of selection and annotation. Ironically, though Sanger is one of the most quoted and often misquoted women of the last century, many of her most significant letters and speeches have been neglected. Uh, and many of her words have been appropriated or misappropriated by reproductive rights campaigners, anti-abortion activists, the press, politicians, and even playwrights and filmmakers to support or refute a claim or political offering. But Sanger's own voice, again, seldom resonates in any of these works. By reading a selection of Sanger's unpublished writings, particularly her letters and journals, we get a sense of a deeply complex, creative, courageous and very flawed uh, woman. In other words, a real human being here. Um, it offers the, uh, the volumes a lot of information on her involvement in birth control and her confrontations with authority, the cultivation of friends and enemies, her leadership skills, her organizational weaknesses. It tracks the exciting years of her challenging the Comstock law, her multiple arrests and imprisonment, her marriages, her love affairs, the evolution of her birth control rationale, yes. But reading these selected documents as a narrative also reveals elements of Sanger's life I hadn't before focused upon. For example, the fact that Sanger had a passion for radical ideas and a desire to lead, direct, take control that preceded her involvement with birth control. This negates the convention used in so many biographies that Sanger was being drawn in the, worlds of Jill, in the words of Jill Conway, quote, to act by forces of destiny beyond her control. None of this was beyond her control. In fact, Sanger's training as a radical and her interest in sex education for women was evident in her earliest journalistic efforts for the New York Call in 1912, her organizing work with the New York Socialist Party, uh, her militant stance on the behalf of the industrial workers of the world, all well before she became a champion of birth control. As my associate editor Peter Engelman wrote, this volume reveals that the idea of personal freedom and ownership of one's own body, the right to work and get dirty as a woman, to be violent and subversive as a woman, to explore sexuality as a woman, crops up in these early documents even before she coined the term birth control. Similarly, it is important to remember that though Anthony Comstock went after Sanger for 
promoting birth control in the women rebel, she was actually indicted for publishing an article called A Defense of Assassination. In February of 1915, she wrote to anarchist Emma Goldman and the readers of Mother Earth, Goldman's journal, explaining her actions. Some of the comrades have sighed sighed and criticized me for mixing the issues, she wrote, declaring that had I not published the article on the defense of assassination, that all the rest would have been easy. I take this opportunity to, st to state that I have no apology to make for that article. If free speech and free press means anything in the United States, certainly that article, reasoning and scientific, has a right to be published and read and discussed. The point is that Mr. Thorpe, the author, had an opinion on a question which at this time was, throwing, was the cause of throwing all of Europe into a state of war, and he has a right to express his opinion. Sanger was first and foremost a champion of First Amendment rights. As we began annotating the documents, we also found several other narrative lines that we found we had not noticed earlier. Among these was the fact that an additional player in Sanger's life in her early years was World War I. Biographers have explored her 1914 flight for the women rebel indictments, but what is often overlooked is that she was doing this in the middle of a world war. The dangers, the fears, the chaos of war came through in this volume in, in a way we hadn't anticipated. And this can sometimes change our views of Sanger. For those who claim she was a coward for skipping out on her federal trial, we have to look at the risks she ran in running to Europe. For example, writing to her sister Anna Higgins in February 1915, she noted, here I am tied up tight in Holland and cannot tell when I can get away. I came to The Hague to study the latest methods adopted by the Dutch League of Neo-Malthusianism. I found dear little Dr. Rutgers most charming and cordial. He gave me a course of instruction and held a special clinic for my practice. I'm going to try to get to London in a cargo boat. And if so, then I shall begin to prepare, prepare for my trip to USA in April. What often goes unnoticed here is the significance of the cargo boat. For German U-boats were patrolling the North Sea and the English Channel. Making the trip to and from Holland was quite dangerous for Sanger. Similarly, in the summer of 1915, Sanger wrote about how hard she was working to get her pamphlets on birth control completed and shipped to the United States. Part of the difficulty she faced in completing this was that 2,000 of the pamphlets were lost when the HMS Arabic was sunk by a German submarine in August of 1915, forcing her to prepare an entirely new shipment. And the war was certainly factoring into her decisions on when to return, on not to send for her children to join her in Europe. Sanger is often condemned for being a bad mother, for leaving her children behind, for putting the cause before her children. No one wants to ask where William Sanger was in all this. He was not taking care of the children at this time. Uh, in any case, uh, she couldn't send for them or take them with her because of the war. She thought she could meet them in Canada, but again, the war interfered. And Sanger's concern about the war didn't disappear when she returned to the U.S. She had three brothers in the service who were called up when the U.S. entered the war. In August of 1917, she wrote, my baby brother is off to Harvard to practice bomb throwing and bayonet drilling and expects to leave for France early in September. I am sick and distressed to see him go and I cannot help wondering what there is in democracy that it demands so great a sacrifice. And we see entries like that uh, on and on. It certainly explains her reactions to U.S. entry into World War II. She remained an isolationist right up until the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. We also see her explain to her supporters the night before her trial for the woman rebel was to begin um, in 1916 at a dinner at the Hotel Brevoort. I realized keenly, she said, that many of those who understand and would support the birth control propaganda if it were carried out in a safe and sane manner cannot sympathize with nor countenance the methods I have followed in my attempt to arouse the working women to the fact that bringing a child into the world is the greatest responsibility. They tell me that the woman rebel was badly written, that it was crude, that it was emotional, hysterical, that it mixed issues, that it was defiant and too radical. Well, to all of these indictments, I plead guilty. And she goes on to say she could have offered a more sane and reasonable approach, but she said, would I have gotten a hearing? Um, 
Also interesting is that Sanger herself orchestrated the uh, arrest and trial and imprisonment for her Brownsville clinic opening. She announced that she was opening a secret clinic to the press several weeks before the clinic was actually opened. She made sure that the trial for the Brownsville clinic was well covered, in fact so covered that it pushed the war off the front pages of the newspapers for several days. The problem we had with the Brownsville clinic was that we had no actual documents covering uh, this period. She didn't, we didn't have any letters that she might have written in this period. All we had were court records, which were mostly very boring, and newspaper accounts. And so we filled this in in head notes and kind of told the story. And we, decide, we decided in focus to, uh, instead to focus on the document we did have, a diary she kept when she was in the Queens County Penitentiary. It offers some specific little details that pulls readers into her experience. Uh, she describes her first day, put me into cell 210, where Josephine Blank is also nearby in the same corridor. Josephine is a very interesting type, a half well nature irritated by chains and bars. Has no use for men and women, but drinks a bit once in a while. A kind, big-hearted woman, considered off, but I think very intelligent. Afternoon drags slowly, and supper and bread and molasses and tea seem tasteless. By the way, Sanger writes an inordinate amount about food, about every meal she's ever eaten, practically. Locked in at 6 p.m., lights out at 9 o'clock. Other women in corridor work for Warden and only come in at 7. So days alone with Josephine. The next morning, cells open at 7, but bells ring at 6. Breakfast, oatmeal and salt, and milk and coffee. Two slices bread, clean cells, a walk in air. Talked with little colored girl, Liza, who knew of Mrs. Sanger. Dinner of stew and bread, afternoon four letters. Uh, called into warden room to be fingerprinted. Told him I objected to being classed as a criminal. Supper of tea, bread, stewed peaches. Uh, it always ends with food, it seems. How many in coffee, no sugar ever. Walk, talk to semi-negress woman, dope fiend, indefinite sentence. Horrible liberties a state takes with human lives, lives. For a crime of drink or dope, which should be considered diseases, a court has a right to sentence her for one day to three years. Women took, look pathetically around the ground to see if the men prisoners have left stubs of cigarettes around. Tragic to see human beings forced, forced to such a low level. Some lovely looking girls here, dope mainly. Dinner, meat, potatoes, corn, meal pudding. Uh, and it goes on and on. It's a fascinating document. Once we had decided that our volumes would, sorry, would be designed to be read as a whole from beginning to end, we were liber liberated from having to cover everything to hit every note. We were free to focus on the elements of Sanger's life and work, which often read like a novel. Uh, we could include mostly documents that we felt captured the essence of her. Uh, as our subject. So, for example, we included a lot of her dreams. She kept lots of records of her dreams. She was very interested in the spiritual and the mystical. Uh, a 1929 dream. I was standing outside of a large building in New York. Seemed to be in the rear yard. Buildings around were very high and the tops were coming down. I could hear them but could not see any fall. Then suddenly I remembered my little girl who seemed to be in the home of a friend, but now that I thought of her, it came over me that I had neglected her for years and did not even know where she was. I began to run through the streets always. I was carrying an infant in my arms with a very sweet face. It was in white clothes and lay horizontal in my arms throughout. I thought of my lost child and wept and cried aloud and pulled my hair. I was grief stricken and I awoke. Um, she wrote about one of her dreams to Havelock Ellis. Last night I dreamed of Bernard Shaw. I was lying on his bed innocently with him. His hands were very bandaged from broken wrists and he was pink and fat. Very jolly with children, his own, running about. Later I dreamed that like a flash of light came a picture of the Madonna and child on a wall in front of me. A beautiful painting filling all the side of the wall. The queerest thing was that when the, flesh, that when the flash came, I made the sign of the cross on myself, as the Catholic children are taught to do. Then at once I was amazed that I did that, so that I seemed to be in two states of consciousness at once. It was a nice dream, so full of color and motion, all because I started to dream of Shaw. Enough about dreams, she said. 
So in the end, what did we create? I think a volume that is readable and that tells you a lot about the person of Margaret Sanger. In 1995, New Yorker piece, in a New Yorker piece, uh, writer Jan Malcolm wrote, why do books of letters move us as biographies do not? When we are reading a book of letters, we understand the impulse to write biographies. We feel the intoxication the biographer feels in working with primary sources. The rapture of first-hand encounters with another Another, another's lived experience. But this intoxication, this rapture, does not carry over into the text of the biography. It dies on the way. Our Sanger volume is a work that I hope will not only illuminate, but intoxicate. Thank you. This, uh, this first volume was called uh, The Woman Rebel. That's the first volume. The whole uh, edition is called The Selected Papers of, Do of Margaret Sanger. Not an exciting title, title, but it tells you what it is. Because in the 19th century, we had a notion of voluntary motherhood that was promoted by many feminists, in which they said in order to avoid being taken advantage of by men, the best thing for women to do to control their own bodies was to practice abstinence. Uh, that abstinence was the best form of birth control, therefore. Unfortunately, that's not a very happy situation for, for many women. Sanger felt that fulfilling sexuality was critical to one's mental and physical health. Uh, and she felt that without it, uh, women would be uh, in, in some way negatively affected. Uh, Sanger's idea was that, that uh, a women should control their own sexuality and make decisions about it, not that they should give it away willy-nilly, but that they should be the ones in control of it. And that without that control, they would be vulnerable uh, to men. Now, you can interpret that differently, of course, depending on what your agenda is. Um, Sanger's agenda was certainly different than the right to life folks. It's in front of the Supreme Court, I believe, yeah, today. Exactly. But the issue is, uh, does, the, does a corporation have any rights? Um, you've answered it. But call the Supreme Court, uh, uh, does it have the same rights as an individual has to uh, think or do what it wants? Uh, and that's the issue they're going to rule on, yeah. But you can see why Sanger is still relevant. Um, and these debates over birth control still uh, are very relevant. It's a good point. Anyone here hate Margaret Sanger? Because if you go on the web, you're going to see her with a Hitler mustache and riding in a car, photoshopped riding in a car, in a Klan outfit. Um, I mean, they're very creative in, in their attacks on Sanger. One of the problems that I see is that um, we so often conflate birth control with abortion. Uh, Sanger saw them as two very different things. Um, in her first edition of Family Limitation, 1914, she supported abortion as a form of birth control. That was the last time she did. Uh, after that, um, she kept pushing birth control as an alternative, as the solution to abortion, and she did not allow abortion to be uh, offered in her clinics or abortion advice to be given to uh, patients coming in there. This does not mean that individual uh, workers in the clinics didn't offer a doctor that they could go to or some other information, but this was not Sanger's public stance. I think that she really didn't believe in abortion, but I also think she understood that aligning herself with abortion would be very bad. Uh, for the birth control movement. And what Sanger had more than anything else was a sense of what would appeal to the public. Uh, she had a really, really strong sense of uh, what good uh, publicity is about. It depends on the method, absolutely. Uh, certainly there are health risks in uh, different varieties of the pill. Uh, one of the problems, certainly with the earlier versions of the pill, was that the dosages were too high. Uh, and there were a lot of health risks. There were a lot of problems with uh, Depo Provera, which was an injectable form. Uh, there are a lot of risks. There are some vaginal creams and foams that are irritable, uh, that ca cause irritability. Uh, one of the things that Sanger believed in, it wasn't popular, it still isn't popular among feminists, was doctor controlled or medically controlled birth control. That it should be given to you by a physician who could then monitor uh, any ill effects or dangerous effects. Of course, when most doctors are men and most patients or use, uh, most people using birth control are women, uh, that presents a problem. And, and today, I think that's not such a popular position. But because there are some risks with it, 
uh, it, it should be uh, discussed. One of the uh, arguments that Sanger always made was whatever risks there are in birth control, they're nothing to the risks of repeated unwanted childbirth. So one can take one's opinion, yeah. <laughs> Sanger had a rather interesting uh, relationship with the Catholic Church. Her mother was a devout Roman Catholic. She did nothing but attack the church for almost her entire life. And her granddaughter told me that she took a trip to Rome and she had the pleasure of meeting the Pope. And uh, she said, hello, I'm uh, Peggy Sanger. Perhaps you know my grandmother. And he said, oh, yes, I certainly know, know your grandmother. Uh, Sanger never gave up on attacking the church. She was uh, almost irrational on the issue. Uh, perhaps because she had been raised in the church. Uh, it was difficult for her to be objective uh, about it. Yeah, yeah I, th I think she was very uh, upset with her. her mother died of TV. She was rather young. Uh, and she did have uh, uh, 11 children dead alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, it, uh, there's always, it's always nice to make that direct connection. Um, but Sanger actually was interested first in sex education and in women. And she was introduced to the notion of birth control by Emma Goldman. She had gone to one of these radical meetings, and Emma Goldman talked about it. And she thought, aha. She had an aha moment uh, and became interested in it. So I'm not sure there's such a direct connection. But, uh, but yeah, but I think once she heard about birth control, thinking about her mother was certainly obvious. You know, um, she must have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm not sure what she would have thought about the one child policy. She probably would have applauded it. Sanger really was unrelenting uh, in her commitment to that. She went to China before the uh, communists took over. Um, uh, she went there in 22, and she went there again in 37 uh, to promote uh, birth control. And there, were a, there was a lively movement going on there already. Uh, they understood the link between economic equality. Um, she was very happy with the communist movement. Uh, in favor of birth control. Uh, she was a socialist, so she went to Soviet Russia in the 30s, and she thought they were fabulous. Uh, I mean, she was willing to overlook a whole lot of realities there because of their views on, uh, on that. Um, the Soviet Union, and I think to some extent China, certainly Japan, had a greater incidence of abortion rather than birth control. Uh, Abortion was very straightforward. Birth control methods, there were a lot of old wives' tales. There were a lot of methods that didn't work. Um, a lot of methods you couldn't get a hold of. So that women resorted to the, uh, to the one method they would be sure to work. Uh, and what Sang was doing was trying to replace the reliance on abortion with birth control in China as well. Of course, if you're having uh, sexual relations with someone who's not your husband or that you don't know that well, you have to believe uh, <laughs> in your partner. Uh, and for Sanger, it's really better to know yourself uh, and take control. Yeah, I mean, Sanger was very concerned that rural populations generally, and African Americans in particular, didn't have the same access. She had opened up a clinic in Harlem uh, in 1930 at the behest of the community up there. Uh, but what she found was that she couldn't get enough doctors, uh, black doctors, to staff that clinic. And African Americans didn't want to see a white doctor, uh, naturally enough. She then tried to incorporate access to birth control to rural black and white populations in the 30s. And what she did there was try to work with the community to get black physicians and nurses to staff these clinics so that uh, people would be more able to come. She didn't wholly succeed, but in a lot of states, North Carolina, a lot of the southern states, they did begin. Uh, to incorporate birth control into public health services so it wouldn't cost people to do that. But she didn't single out uh, blacks so much as she singled out those poorest people that didn't have the money to go to a doctor uh, or didn't have access to a clinic. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you. Thanks for the lively questions.